Sage Wanderer here, and welcome to the Sheep Pen, bah, where no goats are allowed. So before we get started, I'd like to thank everybody who contributes to this channel financially uh, through watching, sharing the videos, liking the videos, commenting in the comment section. I'd like to thank all of you that contribute through PayPal, Patreon, Cash App, and through the P.O. Box. Thank you for keeping this channel going and the videos coming, and uh, we'll get started today with the sermon. I want to talk about the transformation that comes from isolation. You know, a lot of times in this modern society, self-isolating is seen as a bad thing or a negative thing. Uh, it's one of the red flags that can get people concerned about you. But honestly, in this world we live in, a little bit of isolation is good for everyone. And there's nothing like some isolation to help you go to the next level spiritually and to transform and have a transformation of spirit. It's an old tradition that goes back to the very beginning. Uh, recently I preached on Jezebel and how Elijah ran from Jezebel and God sustained him in the wilderness. That the voice crying in the wilderness, the sage monk uh, experience, the, uh, the hermit experience has been something that spiritually minded people have used down through the ages as a method to break through to the next level spiritually. I get a lot of people that ask me in the comments section and through email and letters, you know, how do I break through to the next level? People don't always like to hear the truth that oftentimes we have to reduce our environment to a setting where you can hear the voice of God. You know, we live in a time of constant entertainment. Uh, your phone, your television, the radio, something's going uh, on all the time. Something's playing all the time. And sometimes multiple things are playing at once. The TV's going and you're on your phone. The radio's going and you're on your phone. And we have very little quiet time in this world that we live in. In fact, I would say that people who are at the entry level of uh, demonic deception and or uh, demonic oppression, will fall short of saying possession and call it oppression, that those folks have a very difficult time having any quiet time. They can't stand the quiet. The quiet makes them upset or nervous or anxious or afraid. And so they have to live in this world where something is going all the time, some form of noise. They can't stand to be alone. And it's, a, it's becoming more and more common in this world we live in to talk to people who don't like the quiet. And the fact of the matter is, we've talked about this before, if you want to hear from God, he's not going to scream over your television. He's not going to scream over your friends and neighbors and family who you spend all your time talking with. He's not going to yell over the radio. That There's a famous scripture that says, Be still and know that I am God. And this stillness has proven to be a place where people can uh, engage in transformation spiritually. That as long as your life is filled with noise, as long as your life is filled with busy time, as long as you are always doing something and never taking that alone quiet time, you're never going to be able to break through. Being able to grow spiritually in that environment is next to impossible. It's very difficult. It's one of the things as a preacher's kid and a, a former pastor and a person, I should say former, I mean, I'm a pastor here, right? But I had, a, in past times, I've had a church. And when you live that lifestyle of being basically at church 24 seven, you don't have that quiet time that allows you to grow as a person. And a lot of uh, holy men, spiritual men, people that started out with good intentions will uh, stumble and fall because of the chaotic lifestyle and the hectic schedule of being a pastor. So if it's hard for them, imagine how hard it is for your average person. And before I get too much further into this concept and, and the history of it, I have to say that this is kind of based on uh, or comes with a prophetic word. That there is somebody out there that uh, never allows themselves any quiet time. And God is calling you to some quiet time. He's calling you for to a time of isolation. That you have problems in your life you can't overcome. 
and it's because you're trying to do it alone. And just praying once or twice a day for five minutes isn't going to do it. You're going to have to take that time and set it aside for this time of isolation and quiet reflection. So you know who you are, who that was for. And you know, the message coming through for me that I'm delivering to this person is that you have several obstacles, things that you think are insurmountable or that are causing you a great deal of conflict in your life and uneasiness, unhappiness, and you can't seem to get uh, a way around it, you can't seem to cope with it, and the message is you're not allowing yourself that quiet time, that God's not going to talk over everyone else. He's not going to talk over um, your television, your radio, your phone, your computer, that he wants you to sit still. And this goes back, way back in time. I talked about earlier Elijah who engaged in this uh, hermit lifestyle. But uh, you've got your everyone from sages to early priests who practiced this. Obviously, in the uh, story of Jesus, you have his 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness where this is a time when you tend to slay your own demons, so to speak. In the, in the, with respect to Jesus, it was the big devil. Like he faced the devil one-on-one -on -one in those 40 days, his time of temptation. And, but a lot of times, it's more about unraveling the devil's lies, unraveling the fake narrative that the demonic sells to you constantly through people, through social media. And when you strip that away, it allows you to really look at your past. That's a big part of isolation. You know, I went through a two-year period of isolation. Many of you recall I had the channel at the time. COVID helped bring that along too, gave me an even better excuse to isolate. But it helped me to unravel the mistakes of my life. It helped me to see the role that I had played in, uh, in the failures I had in life. It, it allowed me to unravel the brokenness of my childhood and get to the root of it. And it was better therapy than uh, going, to a, going to a professional, right? It was better therapy than even deliverance ministry to some degree. <clears throat> it's almost a type of self-deliverance. It's why they call it slaying your own demons. You know, in times past, in the early days of the church, some of these uh, hermit monk ministers uh, would go away and live in caves for months or even years at a time. And they would talk about physically engaging in battles with physical demons. I don't know whether the isolation got to them to where their spiritual uh, battles seemed like actual physical ones, or whether they got so deep into this that these uh, specters began to appear to them and they began to get almost uh, 3D images of the demons that had been torturing them and holding them back and preventing their growth. So there's that element where you deal with your own issues. So the time isn't necessarily spent just praying to God. The time is spent being quiet and listening for God, but also listening to your own thoughts allowing yourself to really unravel the mysteries of your past. This is all part of the hermit sage experience. You know, my old man, the old Marine, who we all know was also a, a, a working pastor my entire life. Um, when I was young, he would uh, take us fishing, right? And he would try to go by himself, but me being a fishing junkie and a pretty pushy little kid, uh, he wasn't going without me, right? He, he almost had to sneak off. And even then, I was not happy about it that he went fishing without me. So he would take me along and bring our camper out alongside the riverbank or, or lakeside somewhere. And he would just kick me out in the morning. And I would basically go all Huckleberry Finn, Finn Tom Sawyer all day long. <laughs> and uh, uh, he wouldn't let me back in except open the door and shove some food out periodically. And um, sometimes uh, when I caught a fish that was too big for me to get off, or a catfish, catfish, which was my nemesis till I was about 10, I was very afraid of them, you know, them little horns on the side that cut you. And uh, so I'd have to get him to get a catfish off for me. But it allowed him to have a lot of quiet time. 
and I just happened to be there, right? So he practiced these long times of fasting and prayer, which brings me to another level of the isolation uh, transformation. Um, you can pair this with fasting, and there's something about denying your body that strengthens your spirit. This is not something I encourage people to do on the regular basis. I don't understand these people who fast and go to work and do things. Uh, fasting should be set aside time where you fast and you pray and you sit in quiet contemplation. This process is at the base of every very powerful minister I've ever met. Every person who seemed to know things that other people didn't know, that seemed to have a direct conduit with God, conduit with God. Some you know, people that seemed to have uh, uh, be standing under the glory spout of the Holy Spirit and constant communion with the Holy Spirit. When you delve into these people's lifestyle and history, you find out that at one point or another, they had a prolonged period of isolation. How many people have you heard find Jesus in prison? Now, part of that is the fact that they are locked up and they've lost everything, but part of it is they, are ha they have a lot of alone time. They have a lot of isolated time, especially if they end up in solitary con confinement. A lot of great prison ministers came out of people who found themselves in solitary confinement and they found Jesus in the quiet. They found the Holy Spirit in the silence. They unraveled their own brokenness in the isolation and embraced it. But when you add this isolation with fasting and prayer, and you know, it don't have to be two years. That, that was a time for me of incredible uh, transformation. And you might have seen it on the channel. Um, I got healed of some anger issues. I got healed of some sexual issues. I got healed of some stinking thinking, to tell you the truth. And I came out of that time of isolation with a much greater understanding of the things of God, a much better interface between me and God, an open door to heaven. And through that period of time, I did a lot of fasting as well. And I've not been one to fast for days. I tend to fast for meals, okay, a few meals. And, uh, or, you know, fast and only eat once in the evening. And part of it is I struggle with being able to sleep if I'm hungry. I just toss and turn. And, you know, I have done longer fasts. I'm just telling you that during my isolation, I took smaller fasts. And <clears throat> even though I didn't isolate myself from electronics because I was still running this channel, I was still keeping up with what was going on in the world, watching the news and, and you know, gathering information, I did have a lot of quiet time. You know, I built a garden where I carried water to my garden <laughs> in buckets from a rain barrel because I didn't have any running water there. Um, those types of like manual labor things that don't require any thought that uh, don't have a deadline and you can work at your own pace is kind of the basis of what we call monastic living. That people that are in deep pursuit of a deeper relationship with God will enter into a monastery where there's a schedule with lots of quiet free time and the work that you do is mundane physical labor, tending a vineyard, planting a garden, tilling the earth. All of these can serve as a way of occupying your mind on one level while you're able to del delve deeply into your own issues. You're able to delve deeply into spiritual things. It allows you time to pray. You can pray while you're doing these sort of things. So I encourage every one of you to engage in isolation as a way of getting stronger spiritually as a way of transcending your own problems and finding solutions that are inspired through the Holy Spirit in this time of quiet. You know, you really can't expect to learn anything spiritually if you're not listening spiritually. And I don't mean listening to people like me. Hey, that helps if you can find the right folks. I won't put myself out of a job here. You know, spiritual guidance is important. But oftentimes we bombard ourselves with news and documentaries and you feel like you're growing but you really haven't dealt with the underlying issues in your life until you've gone through a period of isolation. 
it can be very hard to have a family and engage in this. But my dad went through a great transformation in the 1970s. And my sisters had a very, my older sisters had a very different childhood than mine. And yes, I had issues, but they were different from theirs. And a lot of that had to do with this time of isolation that my dad went through. And even though I was present, he was technically babysitting, <laughs> you know, it gave him six to eight hours a day of quiet time, sometimes more. And um, it's, it allowed him to heal some of the brokenness that he was dealing with as a pastor. And it did uh, strengthen his spiritual power. He, he always had a healing gift. But after those years in the, in the mid-70s, when he made a special effort to get isolated and have that sage experience, have that monastic monk experience. And you know, people think monk means non-sexual. Trust me, he wasn't leaving my mom hanging. They had a regular relationship, right? But he would put it, take himself away from the relationship uh, at, for large chunks of time in isolation. And that's actually something that's mentioned in the New Testament that we're supposed to uh, be with our spouses all the time except for when we separate for prayer and fasting. And the idea of a ministerial retreat is kind of based on this, although those are usually action-packed and there isn't much time for contemplation. And it's almost a ruse to make you think that you're getting restored when really you're just filling your life with more people, more opinions, more classes, more events. What I'm talking about is a total shutdown a total time of isolation, even if it's just one hour. Not everybody can afford to take two years where they isolate themselves like I did. But however much time you put into it, I promise you, you will get fruit from these experiences. When you isolate yourself and you cut off all of the stimuli, stimuli that comes from our busy culture and lifestyle, you create a time, an Adam and Eve sort of time, where God walks with you in the cool of the evening. You're restoring that communion, communion with God, that communion with the Holy Spirit, even if it's just one hour. You know, famously, when Jesus was faced with his betrayal and arrest and subsequent uh, uh, crucifixion, he brought the disciples with him to the Garden of Gethsemane and he urged them to stay up and pray with him for one hour. And I've seen prayer meetings that were just, uh, I don't know, I won't, I won't throw prayer meetings under the bus, but that's not the same as having that contemplative, quiet time when you're really soul searching and you're, you're really feeling for the Holy Spirit. You're reaching out for that interaction with God and if you can take time to do that, like Jesus said, just come and pray with me for one hour. If you can just set an hour a day aside for quiet time with God, you will see a spiritual maturity come over you. You will see a deeper understanding. You will reach another level of healing. If you're trying to overcome addiction, if you're dealing with uh, behavioral issues, this is a great way to even just an hour a day to start you down the pathway of healing. Turn it off. Isolate yourself. If you can do it for a week, great. Take a week of vacation. Go to a mountain stream somewhere and don't worry about how many fish you catch. Just worry about the, the thought life. It's our thought lives that are so scattered these days, that are so, our thought lives are being infiltrated by all of this noise and all of these influences. Like I said, God's not going to shout over the noise. And so part of growing as a minister, as a, as a healing as a person, in my opinion, a significant portion of isolation time has to be set aside for you to accomplish those things. They don't happen while you're busy. You don't get healing while you're working. You don't get healing while you're dealing with your issues, your troubles in life rather. You grow from those times of quiet contemplation and isolation. I'm not saying lock yourself in a cave and fight your demons. Hey, if it works, it works. But <laughs> if you can, you can. But everyone can put some time aside just for quiet contemplation. <clears throat> a walk in the woods 
or the park. A time where you aren't worried about rehashing the events of the day. You did that in the first five minutes and now you may be rehashing the events of the last 20 years. That we can get to the root and unlock a lot of our spiritual stagnation just from having the quiet time to think it through. So I'm encouraging all of you this week to take at least one hour a day if you can. 30 minutes if you can. Turn everything off. If you, pray if you feel like you need to. But if you just sit there in a chair and breathe. And, you know, the Buddhists, they teach this too. They call it meditation. And it really does give you a chance to contact your spiritual side. And I'm not encouraging you to, uh, to engage in Buddhist meditation. But meditation is a part of Christian thought as well. It has a rich history. It's a requirement to meditate on the things of God uh, for every minister. And when people stop doing that, that's when they get in trouble as ministers. That's when you get in trouble in life. When life overtakes you, when everything becomes busy and hectic, stop, breathe, and embrace the quiet. Once again, before I go, I'd like to thank you all for all the help you've given me uh, to make a contribution. You can find those links to PayPal and to Patreon, or not Patreon, but PayPal and Cash App and uh, uh, my P.O. Box, my email address, Twitter address, all of that in the comments, or not comments, but in the uh, description, which is also a button that says more, depending on what uh, interface you're using. And you can make a contribution to this channel to keep the videos going. If this message um, touched you in some way, if this message inspired you in some way, if you feel like you were the person I was talking to whose life is spiraling out of control and, and you resonated with that uh, message to take some time, uh, please drop me a message in my email or you could even put it in the comment section. Anyway, I'm going to leave you with this powerful prayer. May God surround you in his ring of fire and hedge of thorns of protection. May he send mighty angels of sufficient rank, authority, and number to drive the enemy from your midst. And as you reach out to him in the silence, as you reach out to him in your time of isolation, may you find the Holy Spirit there driving the enemy away from you, healing your wounds and restoring your spirit. May you find a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ and a deeper understanding of the things of God and the, a deeper uh, empowerment through the Holy Spirit when you take the time to spend time with Him in the silence. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We'll see you next time on The Sheep Pen.